Hey guys, welcome back to the Small Town Gamers Podcast. I'm your host, Carbon107, joined with my fellow co-host and friend, Gnome. Hello, mateys! Oh, God. Alright, and today we are also gathered with our special guest, John. Shemai. What, what was that? All right, that was... Shemai. That's that Welsh for hello. Oh, hello. that's the Welsh for hello, okay. Eric, failure. Uh, I, I really just completely missed that one. <laughs> All right, well, yep, we've got a very special podcast for you guys today. Real quick, we're going to talk about Horizon Dawn, uh, Zero Dawn, I'm sorry, I can't even talk. Horizon Zero Dawn uh, has been delayed. Uh, John, you said you had something about that? Um, Yeah, this was the game that I was most anticipating for this year, and now that it's sort of being delayed into 2017, with the exception of No Man's Sky, there's not really anything that I'm excited for in the rest of this year, which is really sad and depressing, and I want to cry myself to sleep. <laughs> and No Man's Sky also got delayed till what later this August. year? August, yeah, August. August. Yeah, yeah we, we just covered uh, last week, or yeah, it was last week about the delays. So I mean, there, there again is another delay, and it seems like delays are happening more and more. And I want to say I'm, I'm upset, but at the same time, it's like I still rather than put out a quality game than rush an unfinished game because we've seen so many games rushed lately you know with battlefield 4 being rushed uh we know go back a little bit further we had mass effect 3 rushed uh just a lot of games getting rushed that have a lot of potential to be great but you know a rushed game is not great but a delayed game can be so right it's just, so i have I, a question do you think real quick do you think it's that because these games get delayed do you think it's that the developer is giving the publisher an unrealistic date of when they can have it done or do you think it's the publisher saying you know we need this game done by this date and you know here's our deadline for you do you think it's coming from the developer's end or do you think it's coming from the publisher's end uh, i've got a couple of thoughts on that right. first start like the number of release dates that we get where it's just like they're trying to fill in their calendar so it's like oh we're going to say that this like the the best example of that was when um the arkham knight game got released and they're like this game is coming in june and then like a month later they're like oh no it's not coming for like another year like they knew that wasn't coming in june that was just to yeah. meet some sort of investor uh, prerequisite or whatever um but the one thing i'm really frustrated about with the um Horizon Zero Dawn delay and the No Man's Sky delay to some extent is the name one game the Sony have released that is a first party exclusive that has actually met the release date that they announced for it. Every single game since the launch of the PlayStation 4 has been delayed and I don't mind the uh, developers taking time to make sure that their games are fully polished, but I'm really annoyed at Sony because they just constantly like, oh, we'll throw this release date out here and we're never going to hit that. I mean, like, probably the only game that's going to do it is Last Guardian, which doesn't even count because that got delayed <laughs> for nine years. I say, yeah, that doesn't even, yeah. <laughs> the game that was supposed to be a PS3 release title is still not released <laughs> yet. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I agree with John. I, I think it's both because you have, you know, you have to have some kind of specific standard, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, specific date set for a lot of these big wigs uh, on these companies. But the other thing is, too, is you also got to think these, every company has a developer that's pushing them to pushing them and pushing them. And I'm, if you look at EA, e everybody knows my hate for EA. EA just usually doesn't back down and let the game be delayed because they want to make sure their stuff gets released ASAP to meet certain stuff. You know, you have like Battlefield trying to match the same uh, release as one of the Call of Duties. Right. You, you had uh, Mass Effect they didn't want because Mass Effect was such a hyped game. It had so many pre-orders <laughs> that if they would have delayed, then it would have been a huge outrage so they didn't want to delay it so they went ahead and pushed it anyway uh so i mean with these games you got a lot of this stuff going on that i think is just outrageous because when you have a delayed game like blizzard delays their games a lot and as shitty as it is to have a game delayed you know blizzard understands that it takes time to make quality and if you find a bug in your game or if you find out okay we underestimated the time to complete this part of the game then why release it with that shitty part of the game or take that game part out entirely because uh, you can even see that happen on certain games like uh the division uh which ubisoft released uh there was parts of that game that were shown that were not released it was just not in there so i mean right. when you rush a game and take out an entire part of the game that was not in there and completely just downgrade your game to fit the release schedule that hurts the game and that hurts your your company's image i think 
And one so of the you... other problems with Division is that they're releasing, like, they have this post-release schedule where it's, like, every month, basically, there's new content coming out. And they've released two updates um, so far for the game, mm -hmm. and neither of the updates have actually worked properly. Like, um, right. like in um, Destiny, you have, like, daily challenges and things. When they released these updates, it actually, like, deleted the daily challenges and things. And even now, when they've released their second update, there are still problems that these updates are causing because they're not giving them time to get the polish there before releasing them because they have this crazy release schedule where they're trying to get content out every single month just so that it's a bullet point that they can have on their uh, promotional stuff for the game. Hey, we'll have new content every month, but the content doesn't work. Yeah. Which is bad on a game that was already delayed itself. <laughs> right. But anyway, uh, so there we go. Uh, let's go ahead and move on to our main feature. Uh, John, as you guys have heard, has joined us. Uh, John is a guest on the podcast. He's a good friend of both mine and Gnomes. We've known him for quite a while. We've been playing mass amounts of Destiny with him for... I don't know, years now, uh, but we wanted to bring him on because John has his own thing going. So, John, why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Um, well, I'm from Wales, as you probably guessed. I don't know why I'm introing with that, but it's <laughs> something that I, I always tell everyone I'm from Wales. Um, and I am a writer for a site called groundpunch.com. It's a new site that recently went up that me and eight other people co-founded. Um, I previously wrote for a different site called apitchimp.com, um, which don't go visit that site because the person who ran that site had a big mouth of tantrum um, and decided, <laughs> well, he basically closed the site without giving any of us the opportunity to sort of take over ownership from him. So we'd all invested, I'd invested a year into that site, other people had invested two years into that site. Um, and now we can't do anything with any of that content because the person who was running it close it down so we started our own site uh, we uh, gathered the funds needed to like buy the web domain and all the different packages we needed um, and it's really exciting to have this site that i now own with these other people um, and that we're confident that the content we put out there we know it's going to be up there forever you know it's, it's not something that anyone can take away from us so that's really exciting um and we're just doing a lot of interesting things on the site right now. Um, one of the articles I'm working on is uh, it's a preview of E3. So when this article goes live, which it should be going live uh, today or tomorrow, um, probably by the time you hear this podcast, it'll be live. Um, and it goes through each of the conferences, uh, so the five conferences, and it also covers Nintendo. And it goes through game by game, what you can expect. Um, it's currently up to 4,000 words, so it's a bit of a mammoth undertaking, but it's something I'm really excited about. Um, and if you do want to check that out, if even if you're not interested in reading 4,000 words, which I totally understand, um, for each game it's only about like 100 words. Um, so you can just go like, hey, Sony, read about this game, uh, and that's totally fine. And then also we're going to have a lot of E3 coverage on the site. We're going to be doing live blogs. Um, I'm going to be doing news podcasts. I do a news podcast called Weekly Knockout, which uh, the aim of Weekly Knockout is it comes in under 15 minutes. It's uh, the biggest news stories of the week. With bigger sites, you kind of, it's like, oh, here's the top five stories of the week, whatever. But with Weekly Knockout, I wanted a format that was more flexible than that, so that if there's 17 things to talk about in a week, I talk about 17 things. If there's only two things to talk about in the week, there's two things that I talk about. Um, so Weekly Knockout podcast is actually going to be going up after each of the press conferences. So if on E3 you're like really busy and you're like, I want to know what happened at that press conference, Weekly Knockout is a podcast that you can, it should just be like five or six minutes long and within an hour of each press conference finish in. You should be able to download that from iTunes um, and catch up on everything that happened at E3. No, that sounds great. Uh, we will leave links down into the bottom of the podcast yes. for your website, and then uh, if this does go up and your your current article is up, we'll make sure to leave a link for that too. And uh, we'll get links from you for everything else to make sure we have that in there for you uh, at the bottom. So if you guys are definitely interested, and I really encourage you to go check out his stuff. I've read it. Uh, I've listened to him. He's really good. Uh, all the stuff is very great. The website looks like it's going to be amazing uh, as it continues to grow. And already it's already great. So, I mean, it's just going to get bigger and better. So I definitely encourage you guys to check it out. Agreed. But, uh, Awesome, John. Uh, my question is, is, what do you guys have planned in the future? I mean, you say you're doing E3 now. Like, what what is your website uh, goals to go through? You know, through the rest of this year. Um, we've got a number of goals from a business side. 
and not to sort of get too much into that but um obviously this is something that we're paying for ourselves at the moment um so hopefully the goal is within a year which is a really ambitious goal i know but to actually start raising some money from the website from ads so that we can reduce how much it's taken out of our pockets um and the reason i bring that up is in order to become a site that we can get ads on we actually have to have good quality content that people are reading regularly. So we have a real commitment to producing quality content. Um, so one of the things I'm gonna be doing for the site moving forward is I'm gonna try and create a lot of opinion pieces. Um, so I've got a few in the works right now. Um, one that I'm really excited to go up is uh, it's dealing with violence in video games which is a discussion that for the most part has been dictated by the mainstream medium and we kind of have this pointless dialogue between gamers and the mainstream medium where the mainstream media are like hey we have this survey where like uh, aggression in young males is up three percent so it's obviously the video games is the, <laughs> at fault or some horrible crime has happened and oh look there was a copy of Grand Theft Auto 5 in this guy's house so clearly that was the reason why he did this horrible thing um, <laughs> Clearly. Which is just, it's, it's a pointless discussion that doesn't get us anywhere. And I think that it's a discussion we need to have because if you look at a game like Grand Theft Auto V, the, the discussion is, you know, oh, this game is evil or whatever, but we're not discussing should video games allow you to murder a prostitute, for instance. A game like Mortal Kombat X, should that game have the gratuitous level of violence that it has? And I want a discussion between gamers where we're all sitting around the same table. And it's not the discussion of should video games be violent, but more a discussion of how violent should video games be? And is there a line there that games should or shouldn't cross? And to try and create uh, a more nuanced conversation that really hopefully helps us move the art form forward instead of this sort of back and forth dialogue that gets neither side anywhere. And so I'm going to try and do content like that a lot more where, you know, if you want to review of the latest video game or whatever you can go to a different site even though i'm really passionate about doing news again you can go to a different site for that although i do think the weekly knockout offers a unique experience in that department um, but i'm really trying to do these more sort of interesting pieces where it contributes to a conversation that especially in terms of violence in video games i don't see that conversation from a purely gamer perspective i see this sort of uh, back and forth between mainstream media um and and gamers so i want to do more sort of curated content like that right i i do want to say that i i like how you said that video games are an art form because that's often something that's overlooked often people don't consider video games as an art form you know they see movies and other forms of media as art forms but they don't really consider video games an art form and i agree with you i feel that video games they are they are an art form yeah see i don't understand why people would say that they're not I mean, you can just look at so many of these games, and they create these worlds and stories and these, these living environments and characters. I mean, how is that not an art form? I mean, if you can say a movie is, I mean, a video game, Some most, a lot of video games are just interactive movies. That's really what right. they feel like. And a lot of video games, now a lot of the big titles have cinematic cutscenes that is something that you would see out of a movie you know into the video game and i i don't know i don't know why a lot of people you know a vast majority i would say don't consider video games an art form it's it's either that they just don't like video games that they hate video games in general or it's just they haven't opened their eyes to the truth yeah, but it's also ridiculous. the i don't think video games like i think video games are art but i don't think they're just art and i think that's where a lot of people's confusion or misunderstanding comes in because yeah, a video it. game can be a piece of art but it can mm -hmm. also just exist for entertainment it doesn't have to exist as a piece of art it can just be something that you play games also exist as sport which is something which people are mildly ignorant of on mass um where like you know there's an incredibly competitive scene to video games where there are you know millions and millions of dollars worth of prize pots and things like that and so video games are sports and they're entertainment and their art and it sort of it branches out into all these different sort of um forms of things that i think it's really hard to pin down and say video games are art or video games are this it's sort of it's all encompassing to some extent well yeah it's a living breathing world of, of video game entertainment you have so many different things that where you couldn't get from a movie or you couldn't get from a book or you couldn't get from a TV show. That's the thing about video games is there's so many levels to them. Just like you said, there's there's sports, there's art, there's... I mean, hell, there's video games that are that they've come up with that are helping 
uh, patients with uh, was it Alzheimer's? All, it's either I think it's Alzheimer's or dementia. I can't remember. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, they've actually created a video game that is helping with memories. I mean, to to say that video games are are not what they really are, which is in fact all of these things, is really discrediting how important they are to our modern society. I think. And I mean, I'm not just saying it as somebody who loves video games or as somebody who wants to make his living through the video game industry, but in just in general, I'm a video game fanatic. I mean, I love video games, everything about them. And to not be able to see that, I guess, is just, for me, is just, I don't know, insane, I guess. I don't know. I guess I just can't see the other side because of, of the position that I'm in. Yeah. No, and I want to just touch on something is that I work with a lot of let's just say older people uh and they go they go by that and they're like oh you play video games then like look at, they look down on you and they're like oh video games but it's at the same time where it's like you know if they would have taken i don't know what would be equivalent to video games back when they were you know kids oh let's say just a certain type of music people looked at them the same way and it's just that you know for modern day like video games are huge because of like where technology is at and you know where we're at as a society but i think that video games are growing and i think they're fantastic and i agree with you eric i think that people should you know realize that video games are they can be a lot of things like they could help with therapy or they can be you know a form of relaxation because that's what i do sometimes i just like to come home kick back and be like okay you know i just want to play my video game and you know after i had a long day and it's like a stress reliever but a lot of people, they don't look at video games like that. They're just like, oh, they're evil. And, you know, you kill people in Grand Theft Auto, so that means you want to go shoot somebody else, like, out in the real world. No, that's not how that works. <laughs> like, like just because I play Grand Theft Auto and I shoot somebody to, you know, rob a gas station doesn't mean I want to go drive down the road and rob my gas station. Like, it doesn't work that way. No, I agree, because it's like... If, if a person's going to play a video game and have those urges, that means they had those urges before. Right. You know, it's not a movie's fault. It's not music's fault. It's not a video game's fault. Because that's what I think I, I love the most is about whenever you're blaming, you know, the video games or the music or the movies for the kids' actions. But it's like, where are the parents at? Where You know, where are the mental health in, in, in the, you know, any country? Is it not up to par to be able to help these kids who need it? Because if a kid's going to go out and shoot somebody, it's not because he saw it on a video game or a movie. It's because that kid's troubled. Something right. is wrong with that kid. And and just because he was using those as an outlet, you know, maybe, maybe it was. Maybe that kid had those urges and he was able to get them as an outlet out on a video game or a movie. You know, that doesn't mean that that kid, just because he played Grand Theft Auto, is going to go out and run over a bunch of people and kill a hooker and take her money back, you know? Right, right. All right, I want to ask a question to change subject so we don't get too political with this, but what are your guys' opinions on, you know, there's several of several of these going on now. What are your guys' opinions on taking video games and turning them into movies? Because we have, you know, we have the Warcraft movie, and then we have um, the Assassin's Creed movie, and then there's rumored to be a Division movie coming out. What are your guys' opinions on video games and taking that media and turning it into a movie on the big screen? Go ahead, John. Um, for me, I think it comes down to a understanding the source material. Um, like to to give a good example of this, Marvel. One of the reasons they've been so successful with the cinematic universe is because they've understood the comic books, they've understood the source material. Um, but I think another part of it is also understanding the medium. You know, like uh, books have been transformed into movies for uh, decades. Um, um, often when it works and when it doesn't work is whether the director and the screenwriters and the people involved can actually take the book and, and figure out that it works for a movie format. It works for this two-hour story format. One of the problems with video game stories is video games are built normally to be somewhere in the region of 15 to 40 hours. So how do you shave that down into a two-hour experience that is cohesive? Right. No, I, I agree. I think there's two sides of it. And real quick before I get into that, I do want to say that if movies are considered an art form, then what are video game movies? <laughs> you know? Right. I mean, if they're able to take a video game and make it into a movie, whether successful or not, I mean, it's still, that's just kind of, that kind of pleads our case right there. But anyway, uh, on the other two, I think on two sides of it, you have the fans and then you have the general populace. Uh, with the fans, you need to please the fans by staying true to the source material, just like John had just said. You know, you have to understand what made the video game or the story 
so great that it was popularized to become a big enough to make a movie. But you also have to appease the people who don't play video games because as much as video games are out there in the world there is still a huge population that either don't like video games or don't play them but do enjoy movies because I, there's very few people out there that I know that'll be like I don't like movies I don't think I've ever heard anybody ever say I don't like movies they can say right. I don't like horror movies or I don't like sci-fi movies but they're right. they like they may they not like, like a specific you know genre of movie but they like movies right so if, if you can't appease the general populace either that are going to be like you know say say you're taking Assassin's Creed you know Assassin's Creed has got uh, there's like three real big things in that movie you've got the sci-fi element of you know going into the the mines and doing all that stuff you've got the history element of visiting these ancient places and then you've got the kind of sub well, I can't think of the word uh, the stealth and I don't know why I can't think of that word subterfuge I guess the the sneaking around and assassinating people so you got those three aspects you have to appeal to and you're gonna have somebody who likes all three or at least one of them to want to see this movie who's never played the video game so they have to make it accessible to those people and I think you have to find a perfect balance Marvel's been able to do that with their comic books like John said because one they know their source material but two they also have Disney back in them and Disney is a huge company who makes amazing movies I mean they mm -hmm. sell out almost every one of their movies so I mean it makes sense that you're able to take both sides, the, the the people who write the comic books and the people who know how to make movies, combine that and you got a good movie. So if you're going to do that with video games, you've got to find a good balance because if you don't, you're going to have movies fail like or, or just be widely panned like the Resident Evil series or Silent Hill 2. You know, two really good video game franchises that fans love but just didn't really translate into the movies because they either, one, tried too hard to pander to the fans or they tried to make it too generic of a action movie or horror movie that just didn't work. You yeah, to attract a greater audience. Exactly. Yeah. If you don't find that balance, the movie's not going to work. Right. So I think it's funny because, like, like you said, there's like two different, you know, categories. There's just the people who play video games, and then there's the people who are just, you know, people who don't, and they just like going to the movies. And I think that, like, the Warcraft movie, I've never played World of Warcraft. I've, I think it's something that would be interesting to dive into. I just don't think that I have enough time to do that. <laughs> no, probably but, not. <laughs> probably not. But I think that, uh, you know, I see that, and I see where the movie is coming from. I see that it's from the World of Warcraft, you know, franchise. And I think that, oh, that looks like an awesome movie. That's something that I want to see. And, and I look at it from an outside perspective as somebody who would, um, you know, never play World of Warcraft that doesn't even play video games. One of the ladies that I work with actually, she doesn't play video games. As a matter of fact, she calls my PlayStation 4 a game box, okay? <laughs> she doesn't even know, she doesn't even say PlayStation, she says your game box. Oh, and God. she goes, you know what movie I really want to see? Like, this was a total surprise, it shocked me. She's like, I want to see the movie Warcraft. And I go, you know that's based off a of video game, right? Like, that's based off of World of Warcraft. She's like, I know, I don't care, it looks amazing. So I think it's funny that, you know, they have those two two categories and they're trying, you know, if they do it right, they can please both categories. They can please both the people who love the video game. You know, maybe they may not be able to please the hardest core fans because they're going to have to leave out some elements. Because like you said, John, it's going to be hard to take a 15-hour video game and cram it down into two to three hours. But so they're going to, for the mass, vast majority, they'll they will please you know the people who play video games and then they will also try to grab those who don't and uh if they do it successfully they will be able to merge those two together well see that's where you have a big disconnect though because then you uh you also risk pissing off the fans of the video game if you get too either generic or you cut too much out of the story you see that a lot in in popularized movies from books you know like oh man that, that was an okay movie but the book was so much better because this and this happened and they didn't show this yeah, and this harry potter is a perfect example there's a lot that they leave out in the movies that's in the book and then a lot of if you read the books you're like wow that's like that's something that you feel should have been in there but they cut it out right so i guess you have to be able to look at it from okay as a movie it was all right but right. the source material will typically always stand up better than what the movie does i just go ahead john this is why i have a lot of faith well I don't want to say a lot of faith, but this is why I think the Assassin's Creed movie can work because it's taking the franchise and going, right, okay, what's interesting about Assassin's Creed? Well, it's about these assassins fighting Templars all the way through history. It's about the animus. It's about all these different things. And they're like, okay, we've got the key points. 
Now we're going to go, oh, we're going to do Spanish Inquisition. We've never seen Spanish Inquisition in the video games. We've never seen it in any of the Assassin's Creed literature. This is something brand new. And they're taking the concepts of the franchise that are interesting from a narrative point of view and then hopefully fleshing them out in a way that makes sense in a movie. So they're taking something that's not been in the video game and turning it into a movie so that fans of the video game can't be like, oh, well, that wasn't in the game. Is they that didn't what you're portray saying? Yeah. Desmond right, you know, yeah, that that's, kind of thing. That's, yeah. that's, that's, actually, that's probably the smartest standpoint that they have is to say, oh, this is how we're not going to piss off our fans, and at the same time we're going to be able to attract you know, other people. Because I've played the Assassin's Creed uh, series. I think they're good games. Um but the movie, I saw the movie and I was like, hell yeah, like this looks like an awesome movie. Because I love movies and I'm like, I want to see this movie. Just like the Warcraft movie, I want to see the Warcraft movie. And you oh. also have an audience, like you obviously you have like the video game audience and then the movie going audience. Um, and both sides of those audience are coming into this movie at the same point because, okay, yes, if you play the video game, you know about the animus, you know about all these different things. But ultimately, you're going to be introduced to the the hero at the same time that you're going to be introduced, and the moviegoers are going to be introduced to it. The plot at the same time. There's not going to be these sort of, you know, leaps of logic where, like, you need to have played the video game to understand this. Or the video game people are there being bored, being like, well, I know all this because I've played it in the video game a million times before. Right. I... So, go ahead. No, you go ahead. No, because I have a question, so you go first, sir. Okay, well, I just wanted to say one quick thing on the Assassin's Creed. I hate the Assassin's Creed games. I love the story, and I love the idea of them, but I've always hated the games because they're so repetitive, and they're so just generic. Amazing. <laughs> I, I, I can't. I The only Assassin's Creed that I liked from the first two was the uh, Black Flag, and I only played a little bit of it, and I think I liked it, not because it was an Assassin's Creed game, but because it was a pirate sim. And we just were really lacking those on the gaming industry. But mm -hmm. what uh, what made me excited about the movie, aside from Michael Fassbender, because, I mean, anybody who's seen him in a movie, he's an amazing actor. He is, you know, yes. He does good in any role that I've seen him in. Uh, is just the fact that it seems like they're sticking towards more of the... like. Let's take out the convoluted plot of Assassin's Creed with all the crap that they filled that with. And just focusing on the assassins in the time period with focusing also on why they're doing that like with the the animus and everything let's i'm just really hope they don't try to delve into like i'm not going to give any spoilers in case anybody's you know not played the assassin's creed game but they just went really off the wall and that's what really made me just if hate they introduce series. a piece of eden i'm walking out yep that's that's what i'm talking about if they if they have any of the con the, uh, the plot have any kind of contact with the convoluted bullshit that uh, they pulled whenever they decided not to do the original trilogy that was planned and fired the uh, guy who was wanting to make the trilogy and then end it. Uh, if they try to do anything that happens after that, I, I, I will consider that movie a failure. Yeah. So I have another question for you guys. So is there any video game or video game franchise that you would like to see turned into a movie? Go ahead, John. Um, I would like to see something like Skyrim, but not turned into a movie, turned into a TV show, because what I think you can do with something like Skyrim is you can say, well, okay, here's this really interesting world, but here are all of these characters that you don't give a crap about, that you don't know their names, and they can take good actors, and they can um, actually fill these characters with life in a way that we haven't seen them uh, filled with life in um, the video game if you do a tv series if it goes on for like two three four seasons then you've got all the time to explore the main narrative you can go off you can do some of the interesting side quests and things like that you can make your own stuff up i feel like take a take a world that's interesting turn it into a tv show and just just go with it and and don't worry about paying too much homage to the video game. Be like, okay, well, we're using it as a starting point, and obviously we're going to take things like the law and stuff like that into account. But ultimately, here are these new characters in this world that you really love, and we're going to flash them out, fill them with life, and they're going to go off on their own adventures that is going to loosely follow the plot of the game. See, I, I agree. I think the most successful uh, video game style movies are set in the world of the video game with the backdrop of the video game, but forge their own stories. And with that, there's two there's two series that I wouldn't mind seeing. Uh, one is the Fallout series. Uh, until Fallout 4, I never really enjoyed the Fallout games, but I love the setting. I love the world. You know, the, the post-apocalyptic uh, 
retro 50s futuristic world i think that's really an amazing story can be forged there and you don't even have to just just set it in the same world set it in a completely different location from the video games and just go with it and i think that would be amazing you could hint to little like events that's happened in the video games like you know maybe talk about new vegas or talk about boston that kind of stuff and i think that would go really well but then don't focus too much on the video game and the other series i think they could really do um and i think fallout would probably be the same like you said a tv show would probably be better but i think what would be great for like a, an epic movie like trilogy or, or franchise uh probably trilogy because sometimes when they go over three movies they just start getting really convoluted and stupid uh, i think a really good movie series set in the same universe as mass effect would be phenomenal don't follow anything to do with Shepard, don't do anything with the Reaper. I mean, you could have the Reapers maybe mentioned or something, or even have them as a central plot, but take out Shepard and take out all that stuff and forge their own world and actually show, like, this amazing sci-fi universe that, that Mass Effect really built in this world. And I think they could be really popular, but if they try to focus too much on the original stories of, of any of these games, they just can't work. And, and I just don't think that will really sell movies if they try to stick too closely to the plot. And I think that's a, a big thing that uh, Assassin's Creed is going to be successful for. Right on. So, so you uh, so you want to know my opinion? <laughs> yeah, no, you asked the question. So yeah. I know. So the video games. So there's like two of them. One of the first one is the God of War series, but then I think about it, and it's almost like as you play the video game, it's almost like you're in a movie, anyways, because that video game has a lot of cutscenes in it. So it's almost like you're, you know, you're you're the star of the movie mm -hmm. basically i mean you're the star of the video game it's like you're the star of the movie so i think the god of war series if they you know dived a little bit deeper into it i think that would be a fantastic movie franchise but another you know another video game that i think would make either an interesting movie or an interesting uh television series believe it or not would be destiny and people are like destiny doesn't have a story and sadly enough destiny does have a story john knows this you know this eric anybody who has not played destiny wouldn't know this Destiny's story is locked behind the internet it's not actually locked in the game if you read the lore of destiny the story is fantastic and it's actually uh quite deep and it's sad that it never made it into the video game so i think that destiny and even halo you know going from another bungee game those would make good movie you know either good movies or good television series and they kind of did a small um you know television series kind of uh of halo back in uh halo reach what was does anybody know remember uh, there was two that they did uh, forward they, under dawn the forward under dawn and then they did nightfall yeah so i thought those were good but they either you know one of those would be you know one that i would like but really my main one i think that i would like to see is god of war with God of War, how would they, like, do you have an idea in your head how they would make that work? Because I think of that and I just think it would be a CGI mess. Yeah, see, I think it would be, it wouldn't be something that would have to, I don't think it would be something that could be realistic because it would have to be, like, CGI. Like, I don't even know if you could get an actor in there if it would all just have to be animated, not even CGI. I don't but think then at anybody the same time, could be Kratos. <laughs> no, at the same time, it's like, um, at the same time, it's like, well how can they expand on the story because if you play god of war like the story is pretty extensive the way it is like how can you expand on the story even more without it just being you know the video game turned into a movie and not playing the video game you know what i'm saying that's why i said yeah. the video game is basically you're basically the star of basically the, movie. the movie yeah like that's i think that's one of the problems they have in approaching these sort of like they talk about wanting to do like an uncharted movie and like they want to do like a last of us movie it's like Uncharted is the movie. Last of Us is the movie. Don't yeah. don't retell a story that we've already had the opportunity to play. Because in playing the game, it's going to be a story ad verbatim. We have the chance to actually be the character. It's just a more... If, if you're just taking the story that's already in the video game and putting it on the screen, you're actually taking away from it. You're not 
adding anything into it. You can't add spectacle because right. video games have spectacle. You can't add entertainment because we're not playing the game. It works going from a book to a film because then you're adding the visual element. All you have when you're reading the book is an imagination. You can't see that on the big screen. You can't see some like Lord of the Rings where you have like a million horses charging towards like a million orcs. You can't imagine that in your head as as well as you can when you see it on the big screen. It adds something to the source material. Whereas I think what a lot of video game movies do is they just take away from the source material. Yeah, I agree actually, and I think that's one of the things that, uh, like we've mentioned, it, set it in the universe, set it in the world, but tell a different story. You know, use the setting of the the games and use the setting of the backdrop to tell a new story set in that universe. And I think they could do that really well. You know, you could even have cameos from other characters in these movies and it would still make sense like like take uh the the, the telltale series for an example as uh, their video games but they're they're interactive movies pretty much is what those are um like in the walking dead season one you had uh glenn from the walking dead comics and tv show appear in that you know they told a completely different story set in the same walking dead universe and they still had mentions of stuff and you had glenn pop in I mean, that right there is acceptable. If they tried to do, like, the Walking Dead Telltale series following the comic books, it would not have been as successful. You know, that's what you have to do is, is take note of that kind of storytelling. Use the world, use the setting, but don't use the same story. Mm -hmm. Right. Nope, I agree. <clears throat> well, John, you said you had some questions for us, man. Go ahead. Okay. i got to bring this up on my phone. <laughs> I got him, it's fine. Um, so the first question I wanted to ask you is um, is there a game that when you played it changed the way you perceive games in a visible way there was a where there was a before and an after? And to sort of expand on what I mean, when I played Uncharted 2 for the first time, that was the first game I played where I was like, wow video games can be about story like I, I played video games with stories before or whatever but i'd never been really invested in the way that i was with uncharted 2 and every game i've played since uncharted 2 i've looked to see if there's a story in the video games and not that i need that story but that it adds to the experience when it's there so i wondered if you guys have like a game in particular that sort of changed the way that you perceive video games Channing, do you want to take this one first uh no you go first sir okay there's actually two for me um, one when I was a kid and one is more of as I'm, as I'm an adult. Um, when I was a kid, uh, you know, you play stuff like Crash Bandicoot, you know, you play stuff like Super Mario, you know, just stuff like that where it's just kind of like, you know, platforming and stuff like that. Nothing, nothing crazy. You know, they had stories, but they weren't that great. They were just there to, to fill in the extra. Um, the first game that I ever played that I got so wrapped up in the story and I realized that video games could tell an epic grand scale story from start to finish was Final Fantasy 7. Uh, playing that game as a kid, I still was not able to com uh, contemplate the massive amount of story in that game. I've had to play that game through different stages of my life to catch different things and to get different emotions from the story. You know, as a kid, you you see the story as, oh my god, I'm, I'm this yellow haired guy with a sword and I'm killing all this stuff and oh wow, this guy is trying to destroy the planet and oh we got to stop him you know but as you get older you start realizing there's there's you know there's consequences there's uh you know i, I don't want to ruin too much of you know the story but there's a lot of betrayal there's a lot of uh subplots that actually have these characters going through and you realize what you know what their motivations are as a kid you just really didn't understand but that was the first game that really showed me that games could have story and it was the the pivotal game to me that made me start seeking out uh you know not only just japanese role-playing games but also story-based games and i think that is the pivotal game of my childhood that changed everything for me uh, but as i as i grew up as an adult um and, and and you know a teenager moving in it was probably a, a tie between everquest and world of warcraft because those were the first two, uh, EverQuest was the first MMO I played, but Warcraft was the first one that sucked me into to its life of uh, interactive community. You know, with, with video games, uh, before MMOs were out and were really popular, video games were kind of a personal thing, or, you know, you had your friends with you in the same room with split screen, that kind of stuff. But whenever you actually play an MMO, especially for the first time, you realize that there is a whole community of people interactive living in these worlds and doing these different things that you're also doing. 
Uh, and I think that changed my way of how I saw how video games worked because you can have this living, breathing world that's not only governed by the game, but also governed by the community and the people. And that made me start wanting to seek out multiplayer games, not just in split screen, but on online communities. And I think that's what drew, drove me to stuff like Destiny, not just the first person shooter stuff, but like Destiny and um, I, I just lost the other game I was thinking of. But anyway, games like that. I mean, those were the games that really just set me on my path of what I know, how I want to game and, and what really, I don't know, shaped my thought process and when I when I think of a game or what I want to do with a game that's what I think of right on so for me I don't I can't really think of a specific game I guess that really just changed the view the way I view other video games um when I you know I played originally you know on the Nintendo 64 and most of the games that I played on that and both the PlayStation 1 even the PlayStation 2 were like racing games uh, you know Mario obviously like I didn't dive into a lot of other video games and especially first person shooters until Halo and then I played Halo at a friend's house and I was like you know what the hell is this game that you're playing what what exactly you know is the the point of it and from there on out you know after i played halo i first of all i hated the xbox one controller i just oh, have God, to say yeah. that thing was massive and it was huge <laughs> junk but i after i played halo it just made me look at video games differently and i was like wow you know there's this whole other world of you know first person shooters and i played a lot of sports games too before i played first person shooters and now i go back and i'm like Sure, I see some of these sports games that you know come out like FIFA, and they're fun, but they're not—they're not what I want to be playing. You know, once I played Halo, it was like I—it was a turning point for me in the way that I played video games, and I want to play shooters and first-person shooters primarily. But another video game, I would say that I just—I set the bar so high on that I look at other video games that are even kind of like that, and I'm like, if one, it's not as good, and it doesn't look as good. You know, it doesn't feel as smooth as Grand Theft Auto. Because I've been playing Grand Theft Auto for a long time, and I just see the video game as I don't. It's just something I when I when I see the video game and I expect it to when it's announced, I'm like that game's gonna come out and it's gonna be great. You know, Grand Theft Auto 4, Grand Theft Auto 5. They both got 10 out of 10, you know, perfect scores for a lot of websites. And I always look at a Grand Theft Auto game and the way they hand, you know, the way Rockstar handles it. And I'm like, it's just going to be a good game. And then you have other games like Just Cause that comes out, and it's kind of similar to Grand Theft Auto. Sure, in ways, it's it could be better than Grand Theft Auto, but to me, it's just it doesn't sit set the bar as high as Grand Theft Auto does. And I just uh, for video game genres like that, Grand Theft Auto to me is just one video game that will always come out that I feel that will never. Maybe part of it's just being a fanboy, but I just I see the video game and I'm like, it's it's going to be perfect in one way or another. Well, John, so, do you want to answer your own question? I did, on charity. Oh, you did. Okay, I forgot <laughs> yeah, about Yeah, Eric. <laughs> uh, I'm not paying attention. I'm, I'm sitting here playing video games. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, John, what's your other one? Uh, so my other question is, are there any minor elements in video games that majorly impact the experience for you, either positively or negatively? Okay, I want to take this one first. Go ahead. Microtransactions. <laughs> so, <laughs> you knew that was coming, didn't you, Eric? I knew so, it. <laughs> One of the biggest, so one of the biggest games for, there's a lot of video games that have microtransactions, 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 especially now. I mean, I think it's changed the way the video game industry operates, and I think that they're going to be here for a long time to come. Oh my god, I got <laughs> a long time to come. I think they're going to be in this in the industry for a long time to come. We've I've stated that in previous podcasts, but there's one video game in particular that. It had microtransactions, and it kind of ruined the experience for me just completely to the point where I don't really enjoy playing the video game, and that's Call of Duty Black Ops 3. I love playing Call of Duty. I, you know, it's just one of those games where you can come home, you can sit down for 15 minutes, you know, shoot some bros, and then go back downstairs and continue on with your life. You just, you know, you want to get that out. You just a little bit of time to relax. Or it's one of those games where you can sit down for hours and play, and it's still okay. But for me... Microtransactions within Black Ops 3 completely ruined the experience of the game because they've locked these they've locked these items behind paywall 
that a lot of times you'll never get. And they say you can play the game, but realistically you'd have to play the game for thousands of hours to have enough crypto keys in order to buy these weapons. So the realistic way of buying them is going out and spending your own hard-earned money that you've already spent on a video game in the first place, and it's locking them behind a paywall. And because of that, I don't play Black Ops 3 as much as I would like to. I'm just It's frustrating, and I don't want to try to support Activision as a publisher because of it. So there's my answer. I have microtransactions can ruin a video game for me. I, I agree with the microtransactions, but mine is so much more mundane. You guys are probably going to laugh at me. I have a problem in video games that if I can't jump, I get pissed. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Yeah, I hate it more than anything if I pop into a video game and I'm just enjoying it and I can't jump. I don't know what it is, especially even if it's not like a... A, a mandatory feature like you have to jump over stuff it just just add it in there you know i mean even games like smite a, a moba on on ps4 and pc and, and xbox i mean it's just they still added a jump and you literally have no reason to jump you can't you don't jump over anything or nothing it's just there and it, it for me i i guess it just breaks up the monotony of running from place to place point a to point b to point c i want to be able to jump a little bit Right. You know, give me give me something to do while I'm just holding the damn stick up while I'm running. I guess be, I I can tell you that there's like um one other thing about the jumping that pisses me off. And that's whenever they switch the jump button to the most random stupid <laughs> button. Yeah. Like Fallout 4 and and I think Skyrim whatever the the triangle or Y button or whatever. Why? Why is that the jump button? Why exactly? Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. Why, that, <laughs> why would that be the jump button? We've been so programmed to have our standard like X or uh, A, I guess A button to be the jump button. Why would you put it at the opposite end? Why would that be the jump button? You know, at least put it somewhere else. Don't put it on the top of the damn button pad. I don't know. Like I said, those are just kind of just the minor things that piss me off about video games. And it, it can literally make me... Uh, to that point where I'll either absolutely love a video game or I'll be like, oh, it was good. Because <laughs> I couldn't jump. It was okay. <laughs> so is it fair to expect then in all of your... If you review a game going forward, Eric, that uh, every game is going to have a point either added or deducted depending on whether it has a jump button? Yes. No, I mean, honestly... And the jumping if... skills within the video game, are you going to like rate them from 1 to 10? Like, this game has a jumping <laughs> skill of 4. This, this game has a jumping <laughs> skill of 10. <laughs> No, honestly, I thought about doing that on my gaming reviews. Just have a, oh, by the way, this game gets a bonus point for being able to jump, or this game got a negative one point for not being able to jump. <laughs> no, I don't want to. I don't want to put my personal bias in that kind of thing. But no, I mean, honestly, like we we uh, I was streaming the other night, and uh, you know, Channing was there, and I started playing the original Dragon Age, and it's been forever since I played Dragon Age Origins, and I realized I couldn't jump, and I'm just like. I don't even want to play this anymore. <laughs> That's just how bad it was. Such a great game, such an amazing story, and, and amazing game features and, and gameplay, and I couldn't jump, and I was just like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I went through every button to see if I could jump, and then, like, three people in the stream were like, yeah, I don't think you can jump in this game. And I'm like, what? <laughs> oh, That's just me, though. <laughs> uh, yep. John, you didn't say yours. Uh, mine would be the music in video games, um, which doesn't really impact in a negative way. I mean, well, actually, it can impact in a negative way. I think um, the the one time I remember it really impacting in a negative way is Destiny with the Skolas fight. When <laughs> you would be on that fight for like two, three, four hours sometimes. I was mm -hmm, on, I, one time yes. I was on that fight for four hours. <laughs> I was like four beats of music just repeating constantly for four hours and by the oh, end yeah, of it yeah. like you just you just quit because you not because of skull that's because you don't want to hear the music anymore <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> but uh normally music doesn't impact in a negative way but when a video game has a really good uh soundtrack it's something that just really elevates that experience like an example i can think of is like skyrim where like i've done dragon fights in that game so many times that they just they're monotonous and they're boring and mundane at that point but you hear that dun dun and you're just like i'm gonna oh, i'm gonna kill this dragon you know like you get pumped for it um and so music is something that i'm really passionate about in my own life um and when when there's really good music in video games it's just something that really sort of 
it really elevates that experience for me and not to to plug too much um but uh one of the articles i'm most proud of that i've ever written uh, which is on groundpunch.com is the top six soundtracks of 2015 um where i went through and i like commented sort of more in depthly on the soundtracks in terms of like the musical style and influences and things like that but plug aside um definitely music for me is something that can really elevate that experience Right on. No, I agree. I think music within video games can either, you know, make or break a video game too. I I agree because there's certain video games that I reflect on, and when I think about them, one of the first things I think about them is the music. And I'll say it again: Final Fantasy VII, because I'm a you know square nerd. Uh, that that has probably my favorite soundtrack of all time. And actually, let me let me go ahead and ask you guys: what what is what game soundtrack? What music in video games? Uh, really just makes you reflect on like or what let me rephrase that what video game soundtrack that you reflect on that makes you just go that was the video game soundtrack of my life John go ahead um okay well I, I have two answers for this the soundtrack that like if you play it it's just instantly this is the best soundtrack and it's not because I think it's the most musically accomplished, but because it just has so much meaning and feeling for me, is the Pokemon theme. That battle music. <laughs> mm, the second that yeah. plays, I'm just like, that, like just all the nostalgia comes rushing yes, back. Yes, it and, does. <laughs> and that's amazing. Yeah. Um, but I think the most accomplished musical soundtrack I've ever listened to would have to be the Bloodborne soundtrack. Like, that is just so eerie and haunting and it's just the composers behind it they just understood how to put an orchestra together they understood how to put a choir together and just the level of skill on display in that soundtrack i haven't listened to i think any video game soundtrack that has achieved the level of you know if you were sort of doing like a, a classical music sort of degree or exam or something like that's the type of score that you could actually write on at length because of how complex and how interesting and uh, how thematically um, inspired that music is. Yeah, I agree. I love the Bloodborne soundtrack. What about you, Channing? Um, I don't... So, I don't know. It's. I would say, like, one of the... So, I don't know about a whole soundtrack, but definitely certain songs for, like, certain fights. Mm -hmm. But, like, one of the the songs that i still i'm just like oh my god every time I, I would every time i turned on the video game which is halo 4 oh, every yeah. time you turned on it and you were sitting at the the main screen and the woman's voice is like Wah! like yes. that i'm like oh i just gotta sit here and listen to it and then you let the song finish and then you go carry about your business and you go kill some bros but i don't know just that song just at the beginning when i first got the video game you know i was i played with a friend who played halo with me all the time and he had yet to get the video game and i as soon as i turned on the game and i heard that, i was like oh my god and i recorded it and i sent it to him and he's like oh my god dude that's heavenly <laughs> and i don't know just every time that came on i was just like yeah no i, I th let's do it i think halo had one of the best soundtracks yeah I mean, they did uh, honestly and uh, i mean i'm a huge breaking benjamin fan but i can tell you that in halo 3 the moment or not halo 3 halo 2 whenever you go into the battle where all of the uh, Covenant are kind of having their civil war and fighting amongst themselves and you actually have hunters helping you and you hear that dun 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 and it's oh, like oh yeah, that's yeah, a yeah. Avenger, it's like yeah it pumps you <laughs> up I mean that's what music can do in a video game yeah uh, I will, I'll add one more real quick the soundtrack for the, the three Mass Effect series I think is one of the most revolutionary soundtracks for a sci-fi video game I mean it was so amazing because it really just added so much to it and if you guys ever get the chance if you haven't played the game series you know at least go on and just listen to a couple of the songs like the especially like the credits they had like, amazing songs at the end of the credits I never watch credits in a video game because I'm just one of those guys who's like I'll skip it so I can get through and either play again or just see the end credit scene or whatever mm -hmm. but yeah. I can tell you that when I heard that Mass Effect uh, all three of them the the music I just set my controller down and I'm like yes so that there's my extra. I think we can all agree that the best music in any video game ever has to be Paul McCartney's song for Destiny. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love I loved finding that for the first time. <laughs> Just that was such a trade rack. Oh, it was funny. Uh... I I think music's really powerful, and and them to be able to to influence. Uh, emotions into a video game with the music to either pump you up or I mean just tragic scenes in a, in a video game can have like such 
haunting music that when you hear it after the fact you're just like you're brought back to that moment and it just makes you remember that scene so vividly like there's there's certain music in final fantasy 7 where there's a tragic scene no spoilers for those people who will play the remake uh there's a scene that happens and it has like the most beautiful music but every time i hear it i can only think of that scene and i'm just like like i love the song but it's like oh that scene <laughs> you know mm -hmm. so but uh but it can do that in both movies and video games. It can change the experience completely. No, music's powerful. Um, yeah. And to just quickly double back to the conversation we were having earlier, like the discussion over whether video games are art, I think it's undeniable that the music in video games is 100% art. Art, oh, yeah. Yep, I agree 100%. All well, right. that that was great, guys. Uh, I think we'll go ahead and wind down. We'll give one more shout-out to John. Make sure to check the... Uh, descriptions here on the videos because we will link to everything on there. Make sure to visit Ground Punch and listen to John's podcasts and, and read his articles, especially for the E3 coming up. Uh, and then we'll go ahead and self-plug ourselves. Uh, in the next few weeks, you guys will be hearing podcasts from me and Channing about E3. We will do a pre-E3 and then a post-E3 uh, special on our I don't know, podcast about E3. Right, we're going to do a podcast dedicated to before E3 and then, you know, what we expect coming up with E3. And then actually once E3 is over with, what was actually revealed, did it meet our expectations, you know, and did a lot of what was rumored about. actually, yeah. So basically post and pre-E3 coverage. Yep. And then uh, we'll also have one more guest this month. Uh, that'll be coming up too so you guys look out for that special podcast as well and uh once again john thank you so much for joining us we yes, really do you, appreciate sir. it thank you for having me on yep so guys this has been another podcast from us make sure to tune in next week where we talk about something else see ya peace